Hello, and welcome to our Week 4 Supplemental Lecture on Pierre Bourdieu's The Specificity of the Scientific Field and the Social Conditions of the Progress of Reason. This piece is not easy going. Uh, the plus side is that Pierre Bourdieu is a theorist that you will almost certainly run into in your other courses, so if you wrestle with this piece now, you'll get a feel for the types of arguments he tends to make, how he tends to make them, a little bit of feel for his style. He's someone who does work in a lot of different areas, anthropology and sociology, and crosses a lot of topics within those fields. He is particularly known in the areas that you're likely to cover in your other classes for developing the notion that there are multiple kinds of capital, that it's not just economic capital, but social capital, cultural capital, other stakes that affect outcomes in social competition, in social struggle. And in this piece, he's going to apply that analytical framework to looking at what the stakes are in the competition among scientists. A lot of our readings for this week, when we're looking at sort of modernist conceptions of what science are about, make the analogy to economics, talk about competition. Bourdieu is going to do the same thing, but he's going to do it a bit more critically. One other thing I'll mention, because it may be a little bit confusing when you read the text, Bourdieu has a kind of stylistic tick. He tends to put some of his content in small print and some of his content in big print. The content in small print you can skip over on a first read. It tends to be more detailed material. A lot of people would put that kind of material in footnotes. He thinks it's a little closer to what he's talking about in the text, so he keeps it there, but he's cueing the reader that that content in small print is like small print everywhere else. It's a little less important to take a look at on a first pass. Okay, so Bourdieu is looking at the sociology of science. How can you do a sociology of science? What does it say? Everyone we're going to be reading in this topic is interested in a sociology of science, and particularly in the critical sociology of science, because, of course, some of the folks we're reading in our other topic are also sociologists, but they tend to have a more positive conception of science and what it's trying to do. Bourdieu is after something more critical. He says, sociology assumes that the objective truth of the product even in the case of that very particular product, scientific truth, lies in a particular type of social conditions of production, in a determinate state of the structure and functioning of the scientific field. So this is Bourdieu trying to use tools that he thinks he's getting from a figure like Marx, whom we looked at last week, but he's going to apply them more generally to other objects that Marx might not have considered applying them to. So if you want to understand something sociolo sociologically, you look at the conditions of production. He says, the pure universe of even the purest science, and you can tell those quotation marks, they get called scare quotes. When someone puts scare quotes around a word, it means they're distancing themselves from the word. So scare quotes around pure and purest means he doesn't believe the claim that there is a pure science. So science, he says, is a social field like any other with its distribution of power and its monopolies, its struggles and strategies, interests and profits. But it is a field in which all these invariants take on specific forms. So there's a strong assertion here that the invariant is, in every social field, in every kind of field of social endeavor, there's going to be a distribution of power, there's going to be monopolies, there's going to be struggles and strategies and interests and profits, but these invariant things that Bourdieu thinks you're going to find anywhere you look at socially take specific forms in science. And one of the things he's going to say is that the form that they take doesn't necessarily look at face value, look at first glance, as though it is a fight over power or over profit. And he's going to explain why he thinks these are still valid ways of characterizing what's going on. He says science is a competitive struggle, and this is something that's come out in all kinds of readings. It's not necessarily something that is uncommon. It's not something that would be alien to a lot of people who understand themselves as scientists. But he says, what's the stake in this struggle? It's often presented as though the stake in the struggle is truth, and that's what we're after. But he says the stake instead is monopoly over scientific authority. Now again, I think he believes that there's a lot of sociology of science that adopts what he calls a hagiographical image of science. Hagiography is what you do when you write a life of a saint. So he thinks people look at science and they view it as a kind of a sainted, a kind of sacred field. 
and that they have a sort of an august image of competition in the realm of ideas where people are just battling it out out of their pure desire to come at the truth. I'm not sure that this is entirely a fair representation of how science is conceptualized even by theorists who are more positive about science. You can make your own judgments depending on the reading you chose for the other topic this week, but there is something in the institutional self-understanding of science that's somewhat similar to the institutional self-understanding of certain kinds of liberalism, where there actually aren't very high expectations for the individual characters of the people participating in, in the institutions. What the institutions are trying to do is to mobilize people's self-interest, their selfishness, their individual and particular interests, to generate a public good. Bourdieu thinks, by contrast, that there is a lot of literature out there that acts as though scientists are particularly individually and personally noble. And so he's really going to go after that here. There's not a nobility here for him. There are interests at stake. We just have to identify what those interests are. And you can decide for yourself whether this is really radically different from what some of the less officially critical readings are that we're looking at this week. So he argues that the scientific field produces and presupposes a specific form of interest. And he's thinking about people like Merton here, if you read the Merton this week. Merton talks about disinterestedness as a particular feature of science. And Bourdieu says scientific practices only appear disinterested in relation to different sorts of interests that are produced and demanded by other fields. So yes, they may be politically disinterested or economically disinterested. They also may not be. But if they're disinterested with reference to those values, they may not be disinterested with reference to the particular profit that one can get, the reputational profit, as it's going to be, in the scientific field itself. And again, it's worth taking a look back at some of the other people that he's playing off against. He's specifically attacking Kuhn and Merton and some of the people that we read this week to see what you think. Is this a fair representation of what they're doing? He says, judgments of other participants in the scientific field are always contaminated at all stages of academic life by knowledge of the position he occupies in instituted hierarchies. So it's not a level playing field. Some people graduate from more prestigious institutions. Some people go into more prestigious fields. Some people study under more prestigious individuals. There's a lumpiness. There's a hierarchical character. And that is always already in mind, he says, when judging new scientific contributions. And he says the practices that people engage in are overdetermined. Overdetermined means multiple things cause them to be what they are. They have twofold stakes. On the one hand, there's a purely social interest in gaining scientific prestige, which is essentially a selfish interest. And then there's an overlay of intrinsic interest in knowledge. And he says you can't clearly distinguish these things. If people were solely motivated by intrinsic interest in knowledge, certain things wouldn't upset them that in practice do. And he talks about the scientist who's been working and working and working on a particular problem, and he's a couple months away from solving it, and then someone else publishes the solution. Bourdieu says, if he just had an intrinsic interest in knowledge, he'd just be happy that the solution were out there. But instead, people tend to feel disappointed, if not really crushed, when that happens. He says, what is regarded as important and interesting is what is likely to be recognized by others as important and interesting, and thus to make the man who produces it appear more important and interesting in the eyes of others. So he's contesting the idea that scientists choose the field in which they're going to study primarily because they're really, really driven. You think about, if you read the Weber this week, he talks about the mania that sends people into particular fields of research and that they sort of focus on it very intensively. And Bourdieu is saying, sure, sure, but what precedes that is a more measured calculation about what other people think is a cool or prestigious area of study and that that distorts what people go into whether it's a problem that this happens, whether this is one of the checks and balances within the field, might be something that other people we've read this week might argue with. And here he moves into an argument that is very similar to arguments he'll make in other pieces about other sociological phenomena. He talks about symbolic profit. And this is something that really interests him as a topic. So we're, we're used to thinking about profit in the sense of money, 
But there are other ways that people can benefit. There are other things that people can accumulate. And some of these less tangible, symbolic things that you can accumulate can be very driving motivations. And he thinks this is part of what's going on in the scientific field. So he says scientific researchers allocate themselves to fields of study based on the expected yield of return of prestige in that field. So people are more likely to go into a field where they think they're going to get more prestige. And he has this long quote here that really is very similar to ways that somebody like Marx or even some of the classical political economists might describe capital flows within the economy. So the capital flow follows the promise of profit. If there's an area that looks like it's going to be more profitable, capital flows into that. Then as capital flows in, the average level of profit declines. Okay, this is a Ricardo point. Ricardo is one of the classical economists we've not read, of course. The profit tends to decline and then capital flows out of it into other areas. And he says there's a prestige economy within science that works the same way. There's an up and coming field. It looks likely that you're going to get big profits in that area. Lots of people start flooding in. Then there's an intense competition and the sort of prestige profits fall and people sort of scatter themselves off into other places. So there's an analogy to an economic interest, but this isn't quite the same as saying scientists go where the money is, although it may overlap with that. He says the study of science, if you're a sociologist and you want to study science, you have to investigate how scientific decisions are a political investment strategy directed objectively at least toward maximization of strictly scientific profit, i.e. potential recognition by the agent's competitor peers. So it's not going to work if you try to analyze the scientific field in terms of literally who's chasing profit or in terms of who's chasing political power or some of the values that might be values in other areas. But if you chase the reputational economy, he's suggesting, that's going to let you explain the way people behave in this sphere of human practice. So scientific authority is a particular kind of social capital, and social capital is a sort of familiar term. You'll run into it in other courses if you haven't already, but Bourdieu is one of the earliest to talk about it and to use it in great detail. So scientific authority provides legitimate power within the field. It provides the power to define science. And this is hardly unique to Bourdieu. This is something that came up in some of the more mainstream accounts we've looked at also this week. It can be converted into other forms of capital. If you have high scientific authority, you can convert that into, for example, a better paid position or uh, access to political authority. But it is its own thing and can be sought directly for its own sake. There is an unequal distribution of scientific authority. Polanyi talks about this and has an argument about whether it's undesirable or whether it's useful to have that unequal distribution. Bourdieu is fairly critical of it. He says the scientific community is described in terms that imply that it's very flat and there's this great competition of ideas and the best idea will rise to the top. But in fact, the community is very hierarchical. He says the notion that the community as a whole operates together to build consensus is what he calls an official fiction that helps to ideologically obscure the role of hierarchies in the distribution of authority. He talks about the importance of originality and the priority of authorship. And he raises again the figure of the poor scientist who's worked away on something for a very long time. And then somebody else publishes it first. And he says his work is reduced to the status of worthless duplication of work already recognized. Duplication is not entirely worthless. It has its place. Uh, but certainly he's hitting on something. There is often a rush to publication. And Bourdieu talks about the pressures around being the first to publish, sometimes leading people to publish things that are not scientifically sound either. He talks about priority and authorship. So when you're reading an article, the first name on that, author, on that article is normally understood to have done the most work or deserved the most credit for that piece. And he says that there's research showing that very well-known authors, for example, people who have won a Nobel Prize, are actually less likely to be first named. And he says that looks all altruistic on their part, but really they're so well-known by the time they get that kind of reputation that it doesn't matter where their name goes in the order of the paper, so it costs them nothing 
to be generous in that way. He says, the market in scientific goods has its laws and they have nothing to do with ethics. We need to be able to recognize as such the strategies which in universes in which people have an interest in being disinterested tend to disguise strategies. Okay, so there are institutional reasons that one wants to appear disinterested. He thinks that gives you a distinctive interest in disinterest and that it can make people look less, strategious, more, less strategic, more noble than they are as a point of character. Again, I think some of the authors we read in relation to our first topic this week would respond, yes, and that's what you want your institutions to do. If you want to encourage this kind of behavior, you need an incentive structure that's going to do that. Whether Bourdieu fully understands that or not is not clear from this piece. So you have a field, it has hierarchies, it has an unequal distribution of power. And he says the structure of the scientific field results from past and current struggles crystallized in institutions and dispositions. It's an interesting phrase. So you have an institutional system, but you've also got people's embodied or uh, encultured belief systems around how things work and what's right and what's wrong. The researcher's capacity to invest in a particular aspect of the field depends on their current and their potential social capital. And how high their ambitions are may change depending on what that capital is. And the individual's capital is not solely related to their talent. So depending on where they were trained or where they're employed, they may have higher access, they may have better training, but they may also just have the name of the institution or the network of contacts at a particular prestigious institution. And that can tip the balance, it can give them more power in the space. So the struggle for power, he says, is not between equal competitors. Some enter the conflict with higher levels of social capital and have an easier time navigating the battles that are happening. So if you're new, you enter this space and there is a dominant hierarchy there that has a strong interest in conserving the existing structure. Newcomers have an interest in changing it because they need to find places for themselves within it. And he says that you have a historical shift over time from a period where there are massive revolutionary upheavals that establish new disciplines to a period where you have just a kind of smaller ongoing ubiquitous contestation. If you read Foucault from previous weeks, you know, that kind of decentralized squabbling everywhere contesting the hierarchies of power rather than dramatic revolutionary changes that found whole new disciplines. And he talks about the strategies newcomers can adopt. There's a safe strategy he calls a succession strategy where he says it's guaranteed to bring them at the end of a predictable career the profits awaiting those who realize the official ideal of scientific excellence through limited innovations within authorized limits. This is like Bourdieu's version of sort of ragging on people who take the corporate job and settle into the nice suburban, uh, you know, house and two kids uh, lifestyle. He couldn't ladle this with more adjectives that make it sound awful. Uh, but he's describing people who take up a position on an existing research team and make their small contribution to that team and eventually rise up the ranks to the point that they have some position of authority. They're playing it safe for Bourdieu. Then you have subversion strategies, which are infinitely more costly and more hazardous investments. Okay, so this is only for the brave and the bold here which will not bring them the profits accruing to the holders of the monopoly of scientific legitimacy unless they can achieve a complete redefinition of the principles legitimating domination. Okay, so this is the double down position. Uh, you, you go all in. Uh, it's highly, highly risky. It sounds a bit more exciting. He says, heretical movements refuse to enter the cycle of the exchange of recognition, which ensures an orderly transmission of scientific authority between the holders and the pretenders. And it's often taken as a sign of generational conflict, but he says it's better recognized as a conflict over legitimacy. What is legitimate authority? And he asks the question, can the desire for truth itself be an interest? He's not going to directly answer this, but it's an interestingly posed thing. And it is the question that the piece as a whole is asking and trying to answer performatively. What are the social conditions, he asks, which must be fulfilled in order for a social play of forces to be set up in which the true idea 
is endowed with strength because those who have a share in it have an interest in truth instead of having, as in other games, the truth which suits their interests. Okay. This is the question in the setting up of scientific institutions. Is there a way you can get an institutional structure that, in whatever way, provides an incentive for people to seek the truth? The kind of mainstream interpretation of scientific institutions is that they are already doing this, not necessarily by giving people a direct interest in the truth, but by setting up institutional structures that make the truth a kind of a regular byproduct of whatever the selfish individual motivations people have. He's posing the question whether you can do that more directly. And then he intervenes into this debate between revolutionary and normal science. These are terms that would be particularly familiar to those of you who chose the Kuhn reading as your other reading for this week. He's going to criticize Kuhn here, and he's going to characterize him as one of a set of what he calls partial theories of science. What's the problem with a partial theory of science? Well, it tends to universalize the properties attached to particular states of the scientific field. So it looks at something, its description may be good enough if you're looking at something in just the right way at just the right period, but if you pan back, things can look very, very different. And he picks out two here. One is Kuhn, and the other is something he calls positivism. And he says, positivism has the idea that science can solve every problem using objective criteria, and it generates progress through the gradual accumulation of knowledge and technique, which leads to the eventual development of better frameworks. Okay, so in Kuhn's terms, positivism treats all science as normal science. It's just a slow, incremental accumulation of knowledge and expertise that generates better ways of understanding things. For Kuhn, that's a kind of science that you only get when research is happening within a particular paradigm. And paradigms can shift. They can overthrow one another. They can run into limitations and stymie and then get revolutionized and done away with and replaced by something better. And Bourdieu says, well, Kuhn's theory is valid enough as a way of thinking about scientific revolutions for the beginnings of science. But it sort of ends up as an oversimplified inversion of the positivist narrative. It fails to recognize that there's a particular historical moment when science comes to be disembedded from other networks of social relations. And that it, this is quite unique historically. It is similar to the disembedding of the capitalist market compared to the old sorts of markets that you would have had in pre-capitalist societies that exist at various points in communities, but that are sort of well contained within the political and social boundaries of those communities. So for him, Kuhn is taking a dramatic one-off transition and acting like this still remains an active possibility within modern science. He says again that scientific revolutions increasingly make use of the institutions of science itself. So you're not getting a radical replacement and displacement of an old field of, field of knowledge. He says instead the field becomes the scene of permanent revolution. And again, there's some similarities here to the comments that Foucault is making about power and the resistance to power becoming a decentralized but also universalized and ongoing phenomenon. So there's no meaningful distinction here between normal and revolutionary science. The collective order of science, he says, is built up in and through the competitive anarchy of self-interested actions, each agent finding himself dominated, as is the whole group, by the seemingly incoherent crisscrossing of individual strategies. Now, the language here is extremely negative. Okay? Competitive anarchy, self-interested actions, seemingly incoherent. And yet, the institutions he's describing are remarkably similar to what might be described in Merton or in Polanyi from this week. Okay, so it's just a different framing in observing a similar kind of phenomenon. And then he makes this distinction. We've talked about it a bit in my classes in week two. This issue of scientific doxa compared to orthodoxy and heterodoxy. Okay, so he asks the question, what is the basis of science? And he says, it really has no basis other than the belief in its basis, which is produced and presupposed by its own operation. Okay, so it's, there's nothing 
else other than scientific practice and the scientific field that grounds scientific practice and the field. It, it's doing it internally to itself. And then he makes this distinction between orthodoxy, which is a very active, uh, sometimes oppressive, defense of current beliefs and institutions, heterodoxy, which involves innovation around those beliefs and institutions, and then doxa. And doxa is, he says, the aggregate of presuppositions which the antagonists regard as self-evident and outside the area of argument because they constitute the tacit condition of the argument. So doxa is anything that hasn't yet come into conscious contestation that social actors are taking for granted. And he says, the censorship exercised by orthodoxy and denounced by heterodoxy conceals a more radical censorship, which is also harder to detect because it is constitutive of the very functioning of the field. And on the totality of what is set beyond discussion by the mere fact that the agents accept the issues at stake in the argument, i.e. the consensus on the objects of dissensus, the common interests underlying the conflicts of interests, all the undiscussed and unthought areas tacitly kept outside the limits of the struggle. Okay, so there's a common interest in sustaining the scientific field, in certain aspects of that field that no one discusses, that doesn't come under contestation because everyone in the current struggle is taking it for granted. And it prevents, Bourdieu thinks, the full recognition of how arbitrary some of the belief structure is that goes into the sciences and the forms of competition specific to it. So what about the social sciences? Where does it fit in? He talks here a little bit about the false autonomy that's implied by the use of technical language and jargon in the sciences, where there's a constant sort of assertion of great social independence. But there's a particular problem that the social sciences faces relative to the natural sciences, which is that the object and the tools and the analysis of the social sciences concern the sorts of powers and interests and profits that are at play in the broader society. So the social sciences can't even create the appearance of being removed from what's going on in the broader society. At least it's much harder for the social sciences to do that than for the natural sciences. And so it is more visible that a social scientific analysis is taking a particular position in a particular political conflict that may overlap real world contact, conflicts outside the social sciences. Okay. So neutral science, he says, is an interested fiction, as in people have a reason to assert the neutrality of science. When social scientists denaturalize that, when they draw attention to it, when they point out that it's socially arbitrary, it's impossible for them not to look as though they're taking sides in a political struggle, because of course they are taking sides in the struggle. Bourdieu's argument would be, so are the people who are asserting the neutrality of science. It's just that it is easier for them to appear disinterested and apolitical when they take that stance. So he says you've got an official sociology of science and it presents an official image of science. It buys into the discourse of neutrality. And he talks about, again, the same phenomenon that Connell discusses, this sort of American sociology institutionalizing the discipline in particular ideological ways. And he highlights the link drawn between productivity and competition. So there's an assumption, and you can see this in a number of our readings from this week, that the productivity of science is dependent upon the competition between the scientists, so that if you changed that competitiveness, you'd be undermining progress itself. And Bourdieu points out that there are ideological reasons to want to assert the particular importance of competitiveness, uh, among other things, the way in which it reinforces a particular understanding of our economy and how the economy works. And then he talks a bit about the sort of divisions between radical and dominant ideologies. And both of these, he's going to say, express particular interests. So a radical ideology expresses the interest of those dominated by the social field. And he says, it tends to treat every revolution against the established scientific order as a scientific revolution, behaving as if an innovation only had to be rejected by official science in order to be regarded as scientifically revolutionary. Now, tacitly, this is critical of certain forms of radicalism. 
okay, tends to treat regarded this sort of hedging vocabulary. He's suggesting here that, in fact, you know, mainstream science may reject some things for quite straightforward reasons that don't have to do with legitimacy issues over science, but have to do with just the badness of the ideas suggested. Um, but you can get, because of the political struggles going on, the defense of problematic scientific positions in the name of a particular kind of radicalism. At the same time, dominant ideologies pre tend to present whatever the current state of play is as what ought to be. So they tend to be overly resistant to the criticism of dimensions of science that should be changed by treating the existing structure as something that ought to exist in its current form. What does it mean, and this is his concluding question, to talk about a scientific sociology of science? Can you do such a thing? What would it consist in? And he says it can only be constituted on condition that it is clearly seen that different representations of science correspond to different positions in the scientific field, and that these representations are ideological strategies and epistemological positions, whereby agents occupying a particular position in the field aim to justify their own position and the strategies they use to maintain or improve it, while at the same time discrediting the holders of the opposing position and their strategies. Okay, so you can do your scientific sociology of science, but you have to do it by recognizing the interestedness of all parties and sort of deconstructing that, okay, and understanding that the arguments that they're making against each other are never disinterested, they're never unmotivated, they're never just in search of truth. Uh, they are trying to discredit opponents and bolster their own position. And then he makes this lovely statement, every sociologist is a good sociologist of his rivals. Okay, so everyone very, very clearly sees the flaws in someone else's position, how they're motivated, how they're interested. But you have to do more than being able to pick on people you dislike to participate in a scientific sociology of science. It's harder than that. He says, the sociology of knowledge or of science is no more than the most irreproachable form of the strategies used to disqualify rivals. So you can extrapolate from all the stuff you use to fight with your rivals, but you have to generalize it, you have to universalize it, until it ceases to take as its object the rivals and their strategies and turns its attention to the complete system of strategies, i.e. the field of positions within their generated. So if you just take that very same sensibility, that sort of laser vision that lets you criticize your rivals, and you turn it on the field as a whole, you're actually getting pretty close to something that would be a scientific sociology of science. The sociology of science, he says, is so difficult only because the sociologist has a stake in the game he undertakes to describe. Okay, so the sociologist is not immune to this. This is the field in which he operates himself. And because he cannot objectify what is at stake and the corresponding strategies, unless he takes as his object not simply the strategies of his scientific rivals, but the game as such, which governs his own strategies too, and is always liable, to exert an insidious influence on his own sociology. The sociologist has to become reflexive. They have to understand the game that they are playing, as well as other people, have the positions outlined within the field, and maybe, maybe, you can get a scientific sociology of science by doing that. <laughs>